Split ends. Cures split ends. Heals split ends. You know and I know you can't heal a split end. Hair is broken. It cracked. Nothing will make that hair grow back together. There's nothing alive in that particular little hair shaft to make it mend itself. You either cut it off. A lot of times we make a conditioner to uh, kind of make it glue together temporarily, you know, and then until you wash it out and then it's still split. And eventually it'll crack and fall off. The number one source for damaging hair, by the way, is, is not chemical. That's number two. It's heat. When you guys use blow dryers, uh, flat irons, 400 degrees is mostly what you see on those. In the old days, my mother used these. She still has a, has a hair dryer in her house. She's never had a, a split end in her life. But uh, the hair dryer came along and it was a godsend to our business. At 400 degrees, that's the temperature which popcorn will pop. You've seen those hot air pop popcorn pop into popcorn. Save you, you know, all the oil and the butter. Well, if it's going to pop a popcorn at 400 degrees, what is it doing to any proteins and water or moisture in your hair shaft? You're going to cook it because water boils at 200 and uh, 12 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you're going to boil, that's twice the temperature of boiling water. So it just destroys hair. So when you pull it through a comb, if you heat it too hot, whether you get a fracture like this or the hair shaft will actually swell like a hot dog. You know, when it starts to boil, the moisture is trying to escape and it'll split open, called microfracturing. The microfracturing is what basically gives you that crack or damage to the hair because it's got to escape someplace. Be careful with your hair dryers. Take more time, a little bit more time, and you'll have less damage on your hair. Uh, and it won't dry out the hair. It probably is the worst thing that, uh, that we have. It's made us sell more conditioners than anything in the world, and I love it because thank you very much for having a need for conditioners in the world. You've put my kids through college with the amount of conditioner that we sell. Yeah. Is there any difference between the Kelly shampoo and regular shampoo? Yes, one says color shampoo, the other says regular shampoo. Uh, not really. And it's the same thing because all we do is, is very, like I was talking about the hamburger, we adjust the amount of surfactant, sodium lauryl sulfate, ammonium lauryl sulfate, trilorium sulfate, and the sulfates. We vary the percentage to determine how much cleaning we basically want in the product or how fast it works. And that's all we're looking for. In the case of salon products, that we sell for back bar use that you'll have in your market when you're going out to Sally's or wherever you will buy your product someday. We try to bump the shampoo up and the foam booster down. Foam is not important to cleaning a client's hair when you're on to a next step. You want to rinse as fast as you can, clean so the hair goes squeaky clean because you want them out of the chair, onto the process. So the shampoos that you should buy in the bowl should be one with shampoo and low with bubbles. When you want to retail the product, we reverse it. We cut down the shampoo for color treated, whatever you want to sell them in a, in a pitch, and we bump the bubbles up because when they're standing at home in their shower, they have kind of feel that the more lather they do when they're doing their hair and body, whatever they want to do with the product, the more bubbles they are, the better the value. So we reverse that for the retail side of the business, the stuff that you get from Cosmoprof that comes in there and you know wants to sell you whatever brand that you see in a beautiful bottle and we knock ourselves out to make the prettiest bottle that we can possibly think of and believe you me that's a job uh, and the last ten years Redken as you've seen changed their bottle almost six times to try to find a bottle that will really appeal to the market uh, and marketing is everything for a product so that's that's the answer to that but we will adjust the product and then you will determine if in fact it works on that client. That may or may not work on that client. You will have to determine that when you get out in the field and find out what's working for you or not. Question? That also goes for the hair types for like anti-frizz or fine hair? Correct. Because you'll find, a, you'll find a shampoo and not one will be right for all your customers because your physiology, physiology is different on all people. So hopefully you will determine what product you want to use on the client that's coming in at the time because they may need and some clients may need, wow, I'm going to have to have a real strong shampoo, like we mentioned Expand, to get the what in the world did you put on your hair? It looks like shellac or pomade or grease. And we make all those weird shellac pomades and greases for products and customers who need to hold down this or taper that or paste this to that or whatever they use. And so we will make those industrial type shampoos. Um, 
and I call them industrial shampoos because they're made for the working salons. Uh, or in our particular case, we do an awful lot of work for the studios. Uh, one of the products that we enjoy making are products for uh, Hollywood that the makeup artists actually use on the clients. The body paints, the body tattoos, the body shampoos, the body cleaners. All that chemistry is basically designed to make an actress look pretty on TV for the movie they're in. We painted Mystique Blue. That was fine, nice actress, but at the end of the day, we had to get the blue off of her. So she could go home and be a housewife mother, work on her lines, go to sleep, come back to work the next day, and at 4 o'clock in a makeup truck over on the studios, she was painted blue again so she could be an X-Men. Same with all the other actors and actresses. I mean, you know, you don't think Halle Berry, you know, woke up one day and had her pretty hair painted silver. Uh, some makeup artist painted her silver. But Halle Berry doesn't want to be silver for the rest of her life. So that was all done temporarily so she could look good in her movie part. The same with everybody else who's an actor and actress. And believe you me, if somebody's paying me $20 million, they could paint my hair silver and me blue and look like a smurf. I don't care. I mean, that would be a sweet deal for six weeks' work. But that's kind of part of the fun that we do, you know, to make a product. Believe Question. Question. There's a trend to take the sulfates out? Correct. Now, is it because it's just drying or is it actually harmful? No, that's a good tre trend and a good question. We make a sulfate-free shampoo. Mm -hmm. Also, everybody wants one. It became a marketing fad because somebody was looking for yet another reason to find something to differentiate himself from what was currently out there. There's a million sulfated shampoos. They were all sulfates are what actually the cleaning agent and what makes the detergent work. Removing that product means that you're going back to a cleaner that is less strong, less effective. They've been around for 40 years. Uh, Sulfate-free shampoos would be commonly known as the detergent you used to buy, would buy, when you go to the grocery store and buy the rug doctor. That's what went into the rug doctor because you don't need a lot of lather on your carpeting, you don't need a lot of the residue in the rug, and you can't use enough water to wash it back out. So you needed something that was a flash, quick clean to attract the dirt so the vacuum cleaner could, you know, see the brown gooey through the little plastic cleaner. And so that's been around for, for years and years and years. There's nothing new about a sulfate-free product. That's why we use it and where we used it. Somebody needed yet another thought, and the gimmick sold. Because hmm. they had several articles in newspapers about how these drying harmful to your hair. Of course. Well, they've said the same thing about articles. You can't believe how many people have made claims about stuff that are not quite accurate. Uh, and I see them all the time at the chemical meetings, bless their hearts, and we go around and around with their opinion and my opinion, and we all have opinions. Um, one of my favorite ladies that I love to death is Rebecca Gadbury. She does what I do, teaches the same course over at UCLA, and she has earth sciences, very holistic type of product, mm -hmm. uh, ve very vegetable oriented, um, and she be really believes that and can tell you why. And they go, where did you pick that up? Oh, I believe that. So, so where did you pick that up? What scientific article did you read? Well, I just know that's the case. And so it goes in the newspaper, she gives interviews, life is good, and everybody quotes her. That doesn't mean that she's a thousand percent, she's not wrong, she just believes it. I mean, that's why we have religion in this world. If you believe that it's right, and you have your holy book of writings to verify it, either you believe it or you don't, and you go with the flow. But in a particular case, if you can't disprove it, it can't be totally wrong. We've had it for 40 years, if it weren't drying, we would have used it 40 years ago. But it's sold. What happens in this business has nothing to do with science, it goes back to marketing. Everybody comes up with an idea. I want to put Liang Liang in my shampoo. Who cares? If unless you like it, then she likes it, then she likes it, then she likes it, and she likes it, then this client comes in and goes, wait a minute, Liang Liang is selling in my product, I've got to have it too. So we put Liang Liang in her product, so her clients like Liang Liang, and pretty soon, well, half the class likes Liang Liang. I have no idea what it does. But we put it in products along with pumpkin piak, horse's tail, chrysanthemum. I mean, every botanical that you know, I will have put in some product. The weirdest one was honey. Um, one client wanted honey in a shampoo. Now, normally, if you get honey and you smear it on your head or your kid's head, the first thing you know is, Brian, you got honey and jam on your head. Go right into the kitchen, hold his head under the faucet, and clean him to try to get it out. Well, if it were healthy, I would have left it in. It's sticky. It's messy. But I went to Smart and Final, bought a five-gallon container of honey. Gee, it took two of us to lift it into the tank and scrape it in. 
when we were done, I used the remainder to put on my toast for, for break time. I mean, what else are you going to do with the honey? But he wanted it in his shampoo. He claimed that, you know, having real honey and jojoba was going to make the best shampoo in the world. The detergent actually thinks honey is dirt. So when they added water, the first thing the shampoo reacted with was the honey that was already in the product when you added the water. And it flashed against and had to get the honey out before it worked on the dirt that was in the client. That's what science says. But the customer felt having honey was a benefit, and they bought it. Now, sadly, he's only been back one time. Product only sold once. He couldn't repeat the sales with people buying it a second time. But he tried. Question. So, as far as low-end to high-end shampoos go, it all costs the same to make? Oh, yes. A, a gallon of shampoo, no matter what brand I make, whether it's Mitchell, the Finesse, is $1.78 a gallon. Manufacturing cost. That's all it costs. But whatever they sell it for, you got to realize you're paying for salespeople, salespeople's cars, salespeople's benefits, their credit card tabs to take people out to dinner, the marketing, the brochures, all the signs they have to pay for, the modelings who models who want to pose for that for a fee, um, the distribution, the transportation, all that adds up into dollars. And the more fingers in the pie, the more times it has a commission. And you have to realize it's called turns. I make a product, I double my money, and I sell it to the client. The client, in turn, doubles his money and sells it to a distributor. The distributor doubles his money, like Cosmoprof, <coughs> sells it to the salon owner. The salon owner then doubles his money and sells it to the customer. Anytime you can double, 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 the thing is going to be $65 for a bottle of shampoo. Is it worth $65? No, but you've added a lot of people and fingers in the distribution chain until they get there. If you can kind of buy from Factory Direct, well, then you save a whole lot of money, but why would you want to? One of the stories that was odd with shampoo was, was how you get to a product that's cheaper. Uh, when, when I lost Paul Mitchell, and he went to 220 Labs in Riverside, California, they were making that product for, I guess, about 18 years. And unfortunately, Gino wasn't the... He turned to the dark side. He was selling Paul Mitchell out the back door. Paul caught him. Three and a half million dollars difference in what he was making and what he was selling out the back door outside of Paul Mitchell's business. So Paul pulled his business, went to Baki Labs. Baki is up here in Santa Clarita somewhere uh, by Magic Mountain. Very nice man. He's, been, he's, he's currently, currently got it. Well, 220 Labs is going, i got 300 people in my factory. I made Paul Mitchell for 18 years. How do I make a living? I mean, my contract's gone. What do I do? So he had a new silk screen. You know, just like you make on a shirt, new silk screen made, generic Paul Mitchell. You see it at Sally's today. Yeah. Guess what? He had the formula, he had the factory, he had the people, <laughs> turned the production back on, he had the caps, he had the perfume. It's Paul Mitchell, except this says generic Paul Mitchell, and it's way cheaper. Do you buy it? No, no it doesn't say Paul Mitchell. It's got to be somehow different because it's cheaper. Your mind is set to trigger that as can't be good. Well, it's I actually a, tried it. It's not the same. It's the same. It's the same formula. It's the same man, and was the same factory for 18 years. The, the slip, the you know the skinny, super skinny, the super skinny serum. Super skinny serum. Paul Mitchell. I bought the super skinny, and I bought the Sally's, and it's different. It feels different. The super skinny feels more slick. I believe you. Maybe it's all in my mind. I believe you too.